Good evening. Today is Tuesday, April 2nd, 2024. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heather, would you please take roll? Councilmember Lundberg. Here. Mayor Sullivan. Here. Councilmember Pratt. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Here. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Here. <clears throat> City Manager. Here. City Attorney. Here. Finance Director. Here. Community Development Director. Here. Uh, Fire Chief. Here. City Engineer. Here. Roll call complete. Thank you. Public hearings, we have none. Citizens' comments on agenda related items, limited to five minutes. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council members, staff, and public. Thank you for allowing me to have this couple minutes to speak. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the DDA board members and the DDA um, appointees or applications that we have tonight. I thank everybody for applying. I just really wanted to say that I'm hoping as you choose a, a DDA council member tonight, that you take in mind somebody that would have the DDA, the downtown, and we work collaboratively with the city, we work collaboratively with the county. I'm just hoping that you would, I'm asking that you would take in heart the best person that could be appointed for this position. Somebody that has great interest in our downtown, that upholds our downtown, that has a great understanding of what it is to be a great downtown member. Somebody that does not oppose or give strife to what we are doing. In the past two years that I have worked with the DDA, I am so proud of the, the strength and the leaps and bounds that we have made. There's a lot of work done. We don't meet often, but there is a lot of work done when we do meet, and it's positive, I had an opportunity to meet some uh, very influential people today that are moving to our community. I will leave that a secret because it will all be known. <clears throat> um, and they said things about Manistee and they said things about our downtown, about how positive we are, how lovely our downtown looks, how there's not a lot of vacant buildings, <coughs> and the momentum that Manistee as a whole is on. Those things gave me a lot of pride to be a part of our, our community and our downtown. I just am asking that you look at all of the applicants and you pick somebody who is strong and who upholds our downtown. Thank you so much for here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Swidorski. My husband and I own uh, TJ's Pub and the Ramsdell Inn. I also want to address the DDA board vacancy that you guys are considering. Um, when I looked at the agenda yesterday and I saw the applicants, I kind of thought it was an April Fool's joke, to be honest with you. I am not going to name names, <laughs> but there is one person in particular on those, on those applications, you all know who it is that has continued to make a public mockery of our city Bam. officials, our city manager, our, our police department, our downtown business owners, and current DDA board members. Excuse, stop. Excuse me. We all know who she's talking about. Okay, it's not your turn to speak though. It's okay, I okay. You, you stop the meeting. Okay, right? please stop talking. The fact that this person thinks that they can put in their application to be on our DDA board, something that I am a part of, I, I am a huge part of this downtown. I was born and raised here. I am shaking right now. Um, is beyond me. And I am trusting that all of you will make the right decision and pick somebody that is going to have the best interest of our downtown. Somebody that isn't going to put a sign in their window encouraging people to boycott our downtown businesses. That is ridiculous. So please, make the right decision. I know you all will. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. 
I think it's really funny that there has only been one person applying for the DDA in the last three months. And all of a sudden, there are other people who want to be on the DDA. The main reason I want to be on the DDA is to fix the problems of this personal clique that we have. Because we know people, we can have things done in our favor. But I'll address that later. I clearly know you're not going to vote for me. It would be a shock if you did. But I wanted to make a difference because someone has to stand up to the bullying. Thank you. Anybody else? Consent agenda. All items marked with an asterisk are. Oh, Mayor, there's one more. Go ahead. Hey, everyone. How are you doing tonight? Uh, yeah, I just uh, I got a got dragged into this drama myself a little bit. Um, well, one thing that it seems as if the main issue, whether you like Nicole Bromley or not, I, I personally am a friend of hers, but um, um, you heard um, two people from the DDA asking for people who get along and will basically go along with whatever they want, i.e. groupthink. And, uh, I don't know. Personally, I think that's a problem. You might want someone who will say, well, I don't think that's a good idea. Maybe we should do things differently. Otherwise, why don't you just appoint one person and call it good, not, not have a council, you know? You should just have one person in charge and be done with it. That's what I think. Anyway, have fun now. Thank you. Anybody else? Consent agenda. All agenda items marked with an asterisk are considered by the city manager to be routine matters. Prior to approval, any member of council may have an item removed and taken up during the regular portion of the meeting. Items include approval of minutes, cash balances, revenue and expenses, notification regarding next study session, consideration of proclaiming April as Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month, consideration of the United <coughs> Veterans Council 2024 Memorial Day Parade, Monday, May 27, 2024. At this time, council could take action to approve the consent agenda as presented. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion. No, thank you. Heather, would you please take the roll? Council Member Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Sullivan. Yes. Council Member Pratt. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Yes. Council Member Martin Pontiac. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Unfinished business, we have none. New business, we will have a presentation from Dan Wagner and Krista Phillips for the MDOT US 31 reconstruction. Good evening, I'm Dan Wagner. I'm joined by Krista Phillips. Um, we're both with MDOT. We work out of the Traverse City office and um, appreciate you having us down here tonight. Just wanted to uh, pop in. I know Krista and our construction engineer, Jim Johnson, were here about a year ago to give an update on a few things. Uh, what we had coming down the, the pipe at that point in time, primarily the Bascule Bridge project. Um, I can give you a quick update on that, but we really wanted to kind of introduce uh, a new exciting project that we've been working on, which is the reconstruction of US 31, which would essentially go from the, the side of the M55 intersection south to Stronic Road. Um, I guess uh, before we get into some upcoming work, uh, the Bascule Bridge project that's coming along pretty well. We've had a few hiccups. Um, it's a historic structure. Um, it's one of those things, if anybody's done a home remodeling project, you know you find a few things when you start ripping the plaster off, and that's exactly what has happened on that particular project. But uh, I'm sure you've all noticed the bridge is in the up position. Um, that was to comply with our Coast Guard restrictions so that the bridge would be navigable um, or passable for um, Coast Guard uh, regulated traffic. Our intentions are to have the bridge open to traffic, uh, at least a lane in each direction by Memorial Day. So that's uh, kind of where that uh, where that sits. Um, we have a couple other projects that are planned in the region for next year. Um, we have a project on M55 from um, Udall Hills Road to the Cooley Bridge, which is basically an overlay project. And that same uh, year next construction season, we have a pretty substantial resurfacing project of what we call a mill and fill, basically taking off 
some pavement and putting back new pavement from Onekama out to Arcadia. Uh, Krista and her team have been working pretty pretty hard on that. Uh, we're also going to have some pedestrian enhancements in both the uh, Onekama and Arcadia areas. Um, before I turn it over to Krista, I just a um, little, little bit more about our operation. Traverse City um, is basically 10% of our, our staff represented here tonight. There's only uh, 21 of us that uh, oversee an area that encompasses uh, Manistee and six other counties. Uh, we have a maintenance contract with Manistee and five of the other counties, as well as uh, uh, three other cities. Um, so we have about 600 miles of state trunk line that uh, runs throughout that seven county footprint so uh, quite a bit of activity going on there our staff we oversee everything from the issuance of driveway permits to uh, utility coordination um, work such as we're here to talk about tonight which we don't uh, get into the communities uh, quite frankly it's probably the, the, the last time that you know, will have an opportunity to do something as impactful as this project is going to be to your community so we've uh, I think really been putting our best foot forward and uh, I've already started doing quite a bit of community outreach and uh, felt it was a, an appropriate time to come in and at least kind of introduce the project in some nuts and bolts fashion here and uh, we will be as we move forward conducting public input meetings and uh, refining the design as we move forward so with that I guess turn things over to Christy here. Thank you. So we are really excited about our project. We're about two and a half years away from actually turning it in. Um, so what we've accomplished so far is we've got the survey done, we've done a road safety audit, and we've had a couple of stakeholder meetings with um, engineering and the city manager. The um, It goes through Filer Township and Manistee Township. So we consider you guys our project partner. You are partnering with us on a couple of things. One, um, while MDOT's got the road ripped up, you're going to replace about a mile of water, water main, and a couple of sewer repairs. So that's kind of a good deal for both of us. Um, Manistee pays for that part, but they get they get the cost, or you know, a, a reduced cost on that. Um, so we're partnering together on that. Um, so we're looking to award the contract for the construction in December of 2026, if all goes as planned, and we're trying to keep to our, um, we have a pretty kind of cushy design schedule, but that's because we want to do everything right. And um, I guess we kind of practiced in Traverse City, or reconstructing Traverse City, and now we're going to do it the way we would have done it if we had learned all the lessons we learned before we did in Traverse City. So we have the benefit of that. But we're doing full construction, so we're basically rebuilding. It's a chance. It's a it's a really once in a life, lifetime chance to reconstruct a major thoroughfare through Manistee. We're digging up the entire road, curb and gutter, storm sewer, sidewalk, and replacing everything. Um, so it's also a chance for if if Manistee wants the downtown area through uh, 31 to look a little bit different, we can partner with you guys on a tap grant to do a streetscape. And we can partner with Filer Township, we can partner with Manistee Township, and if we're all partners together, it gives us a good chance of getting that tap money. So that's um, something else. So I've, this is the first time we're gonna come to you, hopefully of many other times over the next two and a half years um, as we go through the design of this project and hopefully it's something that everybody has a say in. Um, when we did our road safety audit, it was while the bridge was under construction. So it wasn't a really great look at what the traffic pattern is. And we've been asked by the city to relook at that once traffic opens again. So we kind of, we pushed back when we're gonna have our first public meeting, we're gonna target the middle of July. Um, but that first public meeting is important because um, we have to decide whether or not as a group between the city um, a portion of Manistee Township and MDOT will proceed with something called the lane conversion, also known as a road diet. So a road diet is basically from 9th Street to Lakeview, Lakeshore Drive is a four lane slash five lane section um, surrounded by to the south a three lane and to the north a three lane. And a lane conversion would make the entire corridor a three lane with one through lane in each direction and a center left turn lane. There's a lot of safety benefits to that. Um, the city and the Little River Band approached us about inquiring whether or not we can fit left turn lane in at the Signal at River Road and that kind of spurred the discussion on, well, we can if we convert the lanes and if we're gonna do that, let's look at the entire corridor. So MDOT has already done our analysis on it 
we found that um, we have to look out for 20 years into the future to see if it's viable operationally. We found that it is. There's very minimal delay on US 31, and there's a little bit of extra delay when turning off a side street. So that projected delay by 2024, so 20 years into the future is what we're looking at. The delay off a side street increases by about 10 seconds. So if you imagine how long it takes you to make a left turn now, onto 31 from a side street, you add 10 seconds to that in 20 years, that's how much it's gonna be. So it's not a whole lot. Um, to some, it may sound like a lot, but there's a lot of safety benefits of it. Um, when, you, when you have a through lane, or let's say the inside lane in a four lane section is the fast lane, right, people are passing, but it's also the lane that people are turning left from. So you have a, a speed differential in that lane that causes a lot of crashes, and this corridor has a, has a lot of crashes. Um, a road diet reduces total crashes in general by 20 to 50 percent. It greatly reduces rear and left turn crashes and greatly reduces angle crashes when you turn because a left turn is actually made simpler. Even though there might be less of a gap available, you're only crossing potentially one lane at a time, but definitely less lanes at a time. Um, there are shorter crosswalks for pedestrians. We can incorporate more pedestrian crosswalks in the corridor. Um, including uh, pedestrian refuge islands where they fit, <clears throat> and like I said, simpler gap selection. So those are some of the great benefits of a road diet, but we are not gonna proceed with a road diet, not even to the public meeting without the support of the city. So I think if you're confident in saying, yes, MDOT, go to the public meeting and propose it to the public, we will do that. Um, if you want to discuss it more amongst yourselves and have us come back and talk about it again, I would like to have like a soft yes from the from the council before we even bring it to the public. Because if you guys aren't going to support it, we're not going to even propose it, and we don't want to have to redesign it. So that's why we want it now before we get into design and waste a lot of time designing it as a three lane, so we don't have to redesign it. So that's kind of a soft ask from me today, and nothing. Um, actionable from you guys but after we have our public meeting and know whether there's a lot of controversy yes or no we will need a resolution that's the formal thing from the city that we will need to proceed with the road diet so we're not going to do it without your support we'd like to have your support we'd like to be on the same team but everyone in the community needs to have a say so that's what we're going to do at the public meeting so the public meeting in July we're going to introduce the meeting the project to the public we're basically going to roll out an aerial map and have everyone say, oh, I, you know, this intersection here is, well, we already have a lot of information from our stakeholders, but um, it'll be the first time we're bringing it to the public, and oh, by the way, what do you think about a road diet? So that oh, by the way, may or may not happen depending on the feedback that we get. So um, that's all. Let's go ahead. Did I miss anything? No, it's really it. You know, Krista, she said that, obviously we're constrained by the, the, the right of way or the property that MDOT actually owns through that corridor. A lot of the things that we hear, unfortunately, we, we really can't um, directly address through these types of projects like uh, reduction in speed. You know, we realize every community that has a state highway going right through it, we hear that all the time. You need, we, we want it to go from 35 miles an hour to 25 miles an hour. The establishment of speed limits, it's, 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 there, it's a legal process. It's, it's a law. We have to be holding to follow the law. <laughs> So we can't do things like that. So something like the, the, the road diet, the lane reduction that Krista talked about really is, um, it's the biggest opportunity that we see as far as uh, being able to, have, to do something that will allow the community to, to move forward and also move forward with trying to achieve some of the things that we commonly hear, such as reducing speeds. Um, if, we, if we go from four lanes to three, obviously it gives us a little bit more room to work with within our right of way. We can do things such as pedestrian enhancements um, we're already proposing, um, you know, sidewalks and um, multi-use trailway. We're talking to the communities to see if we can't do something in partnership. But really just wanted to kind of plant that seed with you tonight to, to get you thinking about it, get you talking to your constituents. Um, Chris did a great job. So if, if this is something that the community doesn't want, we're not here to strong arm our way in and say, yes, we're going to do this. If you don't want it, we're not going to do it. We think it, it, it definitely warrants uh, a community-wide discussion <coughs> and, uh, and, and really want to get the community's input on that and, and have some open, honest dialogue. And like Krista said, we have the luxury of a little bit of time on this one. And uh, so we're really looking forward to it and really looking forward to rolling up our sleeves and working with you all. You'll be seeing a lot more of us moving forward, I'm sure. 
Um, got excellent communication with the city manager. You got a, a great asset there. So if, if there's anything we can do, provide you more information, uh, a lot of information on the internet that we can provide. Uh, you can review things from the comfort of your homes. Doesn't necessarily need to be in a format like this, but uh, I guess the most important thing I'd like to impress upon you is we're here to help. So, um, and, and we're really looking forward to doing this project, so. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions? Dan, when you are doing, going north from Monroe Street, there's that dip in the road. I mean, it, it, when you hit it at 35, you're really hitting it. Uh, that's the second or third time they've done something with that. I don't know what you can do underneath there. I know they've replaced it. Yeah, they on that underneath it. That's a, that's a bad area. Soils, yeah, we, there there are some poor soils we're aware of. There's there's actually some some other areas that we're we've been alerted to. There's probably going to be some contaminated soils. Um, Krista mentioned we'll be partnering with the community and in, in, uh, trying to good. work on some utilities. I know that there's a, a, a grant that's been awarded for a, a, a study of the rail corridor through there. So. Yep. Um, We've already engaged county planning. Um, we've already reviewed uh, fairly high uh, level some of the uh, corridor plans that they've already completed through there. So we're really not starting at square zero. We've got a lot of good resources and a lot of good history in the community. Talking to you know some of the guys that have been around the block a few, a few times, Jeff McCoola or whatever, and in, in getting a lot of these things on our radar already. So. Good. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Consideration of amending the Title nine, 9 Non Discrimination Plan. That is nine, right? Six. 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 Okay. <laughs> On January 21st, 2014, City Council adopted the Title VI Non Discrimination Plan. The City Clerk is designated as a Title VI Coordinator and is responsible for making sure the City remains in compliance with Title VI. As notification was received from MDOT and revised Title VI complaint procedures per the Federal Highway Administration. So the city clerk has updated the city's Title VI non-discrimination plan to align with regu regulatory requirements. At this time, council could take action to approve the amended Title VI non-discrimination plan. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion. I'll second. Heather, could you please, I need discussion, sorry. <coughs> Heather, would you please take a roll? Sure. Council Member Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Sullivan. Yes. Council Member Pratt. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Yes. Council Member Martin Pontiac. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Consideration of Ordinance 24-05 to amend Chapter 1480, Property Maintenance Code of the City of Manistee, Michigan Codified Ordinances. Ordinance 24-05 would amend Chapter 1480, Property Maintenance Code to adopt the use of the 2021 edition of the International Property Maintenance Code. As an ordinance, two separate readings are required. If this ordinance is introduced at this time, it could be adopted at the next regular meeting. At this time, council could take action to introduce ordinance 24-05, amending chapter 1480, property maintenance code. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion. A second. Any discussion? Heather, would you please take roll? Council member Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Sullivan. Yes. Council member Pratt. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Yes. Council Member Martin Pontiac. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Consideration of changing fees within the schedule of fees. City Council approves the schedule of fees with the approval of the annual budget. The current schedule of fees reflects that the building fees from the previous contractor in October 2023, the city brought the service back in house. The city building official has reviewed the current schedule and is recommending updates. The proposed fee schedule is easily understood and comparable in prices per project to the current schedule though less expensive for projects that take over six months and less than one year. The community development director and city manager have reviewed the building officials proposed fee schedules and recommend changes. At this time, council could take action to amend the fee schedules to reflect the building officials proposed, proposed fee schedule. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion. I'll second. Any discussion? Um, I just wonder, can we get like an elevator speech like for, for the public, you know what I mean? Because they don't have all this in front of us. And there's yeah, been a lot of discussion with people over the years about fees being too high or they feel like they're paying more than they should. So I think some clarification might be helpful. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor and City Council. Um, as you know, you all hired me to be in-house um, when I started. Uh, I noticed that safe build building permit fee schedule was the last adopted fee schedule. Um, that fee schedule is very complicated. Um, 
as far as the cost of that fee schedule. It's mid to high range according to the west side of the state. Um, when I adopt, when I reviewed this um, and looked at the proposed schedule in front of you, I tried to keep it um, as close as I could, maybe a little less in some categories. Looking at residential primarily, that's the need in the community. Tried to make the residential a little bit less, but staying in, in tune with um, the surrounding areas. So um, that was the premise of what I was trying to accomplish, and I think I did, reviewing it with the community development director and the city manager. Um, simply, if you're going to build a house in Manistee, you're going to take the square footage, you're going to time it by 30 cents. Uh, south of here, you're paying 45 to 50 cents. You get up north into Traverse City, you're going to pay a little bit more. Um, if you're going to add a finished basement to that, you add 150 bucks. It's pretty simple. A homeowner could look at this fee schedule online and anticipate their cost of their uh, building permit. You look at safe builds and you scratch your head and you say the first thousand is this much and then anything over that, you add three dollars and then you add six, uh, 150 dollars and next thing you know you're confused and it takes a degree to figure it out so get away from that um, commercials real similar uh, commercial is a typical cost of project using the state table of construction values which you see on the uh, fourth page of this these construction values from the state haven't gone up in many many years they keep the cost artificially low because they don't want the building permits to go up in commercial. Um, an A1 assembly, uh, 5B construction, it's $127.07 a square foot. Everybody knows you can't build anything for under $300 a square foot right now. But that keeps the building permits down and reasonable. Uh, you times that by 0 .0035 and you got the cost of your permit. Lays out some other Typical things in here itemizes it. Um, one notable thing we want to promote accessibility, a handicap ramp for anybody in the city is twenty-five dollars. That's it. We want to make sure they're safe, but we want to make, we want to promote that type of activity being built and promote the inspection of those so our handicapped people aren't falling off of unsafe structures. So um, that's really the the premise of this. <clears throat> a couple other major factors that I want to point out. Um, I'm proposing a one-year building permit. Your previous contractor had a six-month building permit, and then once you got to renew that, you start paying more fees and more fees and more fees. So comparatively speaking, right off the bat, you're paying less for a building permit because it's twice as long. Um, the other, once you get to one year, there's a one-year renewal uh, fee for $75. Don't want to go any longer than that because we don't want to promote projects that are going to take two, three, four years. That's when you start seeing half of the building sited, um, the interior of a building gutted out for five years and nobody finishing. Uh, so at that point, two years, you go beyond two years, you're reapplying for a new permit and we can track that and kind of encourage people to finish up their projects. Um, easier to understand, a longer time frame, and a renewal fee that's really reasonable. These permit fees include certificate of occupancies. You don't have to pay extra anymore. And they include all the inspections. So if somebody really needs help from the building inspector, I, I will go there 20 times if need be. Your typical project will take three inspections, maybe four. Any questions? Sounds like you've been really busy, and um, I just appreciate the work that you and your department and everybody did on that, because I think it clarifies a lot and makes it much more user-friendly for our community. So thank you. Thank you. Sure. Heather, would you please take roll? Councilmember Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Sullivan. Yes. Councilmember Pratt. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. 
Motion approved. Thank you. Consideration of applications to boards and commissions. The city clerk has taken action to advertise vacancies on the Board of Review, Compensation Commission, Downtown Development Authority, Harbor Commission, Historic District Commission, Neighborhood Restoration and Beautification Commission, Peg Commission, and Tree Commission. Mayoral and manager appointments require motion, second, and council voted support. <coughs> nominations for council appointments do not require a second. After all nominations are made, council votes on the nominees until one nominee receives the majority of support. Following applications have been received for the Downtown Development Authority, one vacancy interest member term ending 6-30-2026, Purpose Central Business District and Tax Increment <coughs> Financing Authority, Manager Appointment. The nominees are, or the appointments are Nicole Bromley, 282 6th Avenue, James Oswald, 615 Maple Street, Benjamin Crowley, 636 River Street, and Tristan Carroll, 1525 County Line Road. Mr. Gamble. Thank you, Mayor. Um, some good applicants. I'd like to thank everyone for applying. Um, after speaking with the Mayor, I'd like to um, appoint Benjamin Crowley, 363 River Street. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion. I'll second. Heather, would you please take roll? Councilmember Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Sullivan. Yes. Councilmember Pratt. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Historic District Commission, one vacancy term ending 228-25. Purpose, Historic Preservation Council appointment. Ed Kriskowitz, 387 River Street. Is there a nomination? I'll nominee um, Ed Kriskowitz for the term ending on 228-25. Thank you. Heather, would you please take roll? Councilmember Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Sullivan. Yes. Councilmember Pratt. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Yes. Nomination approved. Thank you. Neighborhood Restoration and Beautification Commission. Four vacancies, two terms ending 43026 and two terms ending 43027. The purpose identify, research, and recommend opportunities and resources to help prevent, remediate, and eliminate blight and help beautify the city of Manistee. Mary Kay Wilkosh, 253 7th Street, Kayla William, Willem, 1113 Walnut Street, Kathleen Grabowski, 1235 Cornell Street, Sarah Harless, 311 5th Street. At this time, council will take action to make appointments as noted. Sir, nominations. I'd like to nominate Sarah Harless for term ending on 4-30-27. Heather, would you please take roll? Councilmember Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Sullivan. Yes. Councilmember Pratt. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Yes. Nomination approved. Thank you. The other nominations? Um, I'll nominate Kathleen Grabowski, ending for the other term on 430 of 27. Heather, would you please take roll? Councilmember Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Sullivan. Yes. Councilmember Pratt. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Yes. Nomination approved. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I'd like to nominate Mary Kay Wilkos. Uh, I guess we only got the 43026 terms left. Heather, would you please take roll? Councilmember Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Sullivan. Yes. Councilmember Pratt. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Yes. Nomination approved. Thank you. And the last one. I'll nominate Kayla Willem for the term ending on 43026. Thank you. Heather, would you please take roll? Councilmember Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Sullivan. Yes. Councilmember Pratt. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Yes. Nomination approved. Thank you. Now we will have a report from Mark Sakaki and Lori Hatcher for the Manistee Housing Commission. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Mark Sahaki, the Operations Manager for the Housing Commission and have been with the Commission since April 23. This is Lori Hatcher. She's the Director of the Housing Commission. Um, she started in May of 23 and was appointed Director in October. So first slide is just the current roster. Um, obviously, you know, we have a vacant um, position on the Housing Commission. Um, Mr. Smith resigned. Um, Mr. Fosdick had an emergency tonight, otherwise he would be here. 
two. No, I'm going to just go to the next one. Staff. Um, just like to point out that the administrative staff since uh, April 1st of 2023, there's only one remaining uh, member present in April of 23. So we'll go to the next one. Okay, so we just wanted to talk. Um, currently the Housing Commission, the public housing inventory is 47 scattered site units. We're gonna talk about Century Terrace and Harborview, but that's not part of the public housing portfolio anymore. But you can see we, we put a map, most of them are uh, in Vine Street and in Holly Court. And then we typed in the addresses of the various uh, sites scattered throughout the city. So and there's just a couple pictures of uh, some of the inventory of the scattered sites. So the other program that the Housing Commission runs is, oh, go back one, so, so we have three single family homes that were funded uh, through a domestic violence grant from MISHTA. So we, we didn't disclose the addresses because we try to protect the victims and residences. And if you are looking for that house in Manistee, you won't find it because that's just a, a picture that we <laughs> inserted in there. So, uh, all right. So Century Terrace and Harborview. So you all know you were here when um, the discussions were going on about converting the buildings from public housing to a blended uh, approach which had this rental assistance demonstration program and then low-income housing tax credits so that's that happened I think that started back in 21 um, so let's go to the next one so you've seen this slide before but I, we put it back in here so that's kind of the ownership structure it's a little complex um, you know there were lots of ways this project could have been done they chose this route um, and that's that's how we're operating now and then Lori next slide oh, we went one two so I guess the good news about the structure that was put in place was after the compliance period of the tax credits of 15 years the investors are out then the property fully comes back to the housing so now we're in a partnership uh, we're the managing partner uh, so I know this slide, you've seen that before, but I just wanted to, just in case anybody had any questions about the, the ownership structure. So here's some of the before pictures. You've seen these before too. And after, uh, the units look good, really good. Um, all right, next, Lori. So some of the notable work that was done, windows, flooring, cabinets. Um, but I will say a majority of the money was spent on infrastructure. So um, the roof, the electrical components, we put all new services in. It was like two and a half million dollars, but the tenants, you wouldn't see that in the, you know, from a tenant's perspective. Um, new roofs, new makeup air systems, new elevators. So, and I, we wanted to point out there were three local uh, subcontractors that, that worked on the project. Swidorsky uh, excavating, Jason Thompson landscaping, and Topline Electric, and they all did an outstanding job. Um, so, you know, there were issues. I mean, we've, I think you've talked about it, you've seen it. Um, the timing of the project was difficult because we we're coming off the whole COVID closures. So, and back to the, um, the electrical components. Some of the components took 12 to 18 months to show up. Generators and electrical switch gear. Prices increased, so there was a reduction in the scope of work. Um, so some of the things that you probably were told that we're gonna get done, didn't get done. Um, that wasn't a decision we were part of, but that was the development team made those decisions. Um, I probably would have made some different decisions. I think the current housing commission would have made some different decisions. Um, but, and the tenant relocation issue, I know you heard about that. Uh, that happened at Century Terrace. Folks were promised to relocate back into their same units. Not everybody did. So we've corrected that since then. So. Um, and then just with the project management, um, you know, there was conflict between the, the folks involved with it and the administrative staff, so that led to some problems, but I think we've corrected that now. So some of the future concerns. Um, the project, the permanent, or the construction loan closed in December, so now we're on a, uh, it was converted to a permanent debt, so as far as the investors are concerned, the project's done. 
So now, starting in January, we'll have a full year of revenue and expenses, so we'll be able to fully evaluate how the property uh, does. And we think it, it'll, it'll cash flow fine, and we're hoping that there's gonna be enough cash flow that we can catch up on some of the things that weren't done. So that's one of our goals. And um, you know, the, the maintenance shed should have been done. The riverbank didn't get addressed. You know, there's some issues on the riverbank. Um, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, so in April of 23, there were 58 vacancies in Century Terrace and Harbor View and nine in the scattered sites. And so as of March 31st, 24, nine vacancies and six vacancies in the scattered sites. So we went from 70% in a year to 93%. Why we had 58 vacancies, we're not quite certain. Um, some would think that was done intentional for some reasons, we're not certain, but um, Lori has worked really hard in the last year trying to get <clears throat> apartments rented, and that's what we're in the business to do, is house folks. So we've made a real concentrated effort to do that. Um, our goal is 97%, um, and, but we won't rest until we're 100%. Uh, so some of the things that are going on right now, um, some of the scattered sites, uh, we're undergoing some renovations on 10th Street, and they were held offline or held vacant for several years. We're not certain why that was. Um, but, you know, we know that we need housing in, in Manistee, so we made it, the Housing Commission has made a focused effort to get these properties back online. Um, 12th Street House, uh, you know, you all know that situation. That was, it's been a difficult situation for the community, and we recognize that and made some changes. The occupant's no longer there. That's currently under a renovation um, by a dam check construction. So we hope to, we did a punch list today on the, on the uh, work. So flooring's next and then that'll be ready for re-renting. So this, the future of the scattered sites. So one thing we wanted to talk about, uh, and I think it's pretty evident, there's been some disinvestment in the scattered site units. So, um, we, the Housing Commission went through a process where we uh, sent out an RFP for a new RAD consultant to help us evaluate the potentials for the scattered sites and what's the best approach. I mean, do we, do we look at renovating? Are they worth renovating? And that's the analysis we're gonna go through. Do we demolish and look for another site to rebuild or do we rebuild on that site? Do we add existing units if we can? So those are some discussions, and um, at the end of the presentation, we're gonna ask that you, we do this jointly, hopefully. So, um, some notable operational improvements. We've created designated smoking areas at Century Terrace. <coughs> you, you, there were some issues in the neighborhood where people were on corners and sidewalks and trespassing, so uh, we tried to uh, resolve that situation. Uh, we cleaned some vegetation and overgrowth on the riverbank and removed trees. Um, or if you go to the next one. So you can see the, the before of Harborview, believe it or not, there's a beautiful retaining wall there. And so we cleared that out. Um, Thompson uh, Landscaping did that for us while they were on site. And most of, the, most of the growth there was volunteer growth and a lot of poison ivy in those uh, retaining walls. So. The other issue we had, um, I was gonna kid the city manager, because that's me down standing on the, he kept telling me to go farther out, farther out on the, on the trees out there. But So Swidorsky, Swidorsky was on site, so um, this, Mr. Gamble called me and said we had an issue with river navigation, so, um, and he, he took the lead and helped us get approvals from the Army Corps to remove the trees so we could clean up the riverfront there, so it looks much Good. better. Great job, thank you. So, uh, so we've contracted with a new pest control company and new policies. Um, Lori worked with Consumers Energy and DTE to get some money to do new appliances and, and tune-ups. Um, we re renovated the kitchen uh, for the uh, Century Terrace community room that was vacant for, or was down for about five years. And then obviously we've been trying to uh, renovate and lease the long-term or long-term vacant scattered site units. So uh, under the governance side, the, the Housing Commission itself has been focused on improving uh, the, the administrative part of it. Um, we've become a focus on becoming resident-centered, which means 
the residents are a priority. So now we have um, office hours from 8 a.m., 9 a.m.? So 8 to 5, eight and to then five. the windows open 9 to 4 every day, Monday through Friday. And we answer the phones. It used to be we were only open two hours a day for resident um, interaction, so we've changed that. You know that we've revised the bylaws. We've sent them to you for your approval. Uh, we changed the um, Riverside, uh, our nonprofit, so that mirrors uh, the Housing Commission, so it's the same board members that serve on the nonprofit. It wasn't that way. Uh, we amended the procurement policy. We addressed, um, a lot of this was addressing the forensic audit findings that uh, uh, were, were issued. Uh, we're enforcing lease provisions and policies, um, doing rental, ins doing unit inspections. Lori's worked with the residents to, do, to uh, develop a resident council. And uh, we contracted with KMG, a management company, for leasing and oversight of the Century Terrace and Harbor View units because it's tax credit units and it's a uh, IRS compliance issue. So we have uh, experts that will help us. And so it's just some community generosity. Um, United Way provided some supplies for us and bed frames. Um, next, Lori, flower store donated some roses to us. We thought that would be nice. Um, we just put some of the Alice statistics in there if you haven't seen those before. And I want to introduce Karen Goodman and Jenny Pelton. They are our two commissioner representatives here tonight. Good evening. Um, just want to quickly thank publicly both Mark and Lori in a very short period of time. What about a year? A little bit over a year. Um, they have righted the ship. Um, you know, and I appreciate all the help that Bill has provided, the support the council has provided. The forensic audit was um, really a great collaborative that we used positively to be able to try to figure out where we're at. I was so appreciative when Jenny got on the board. Um, it's just been marvelous because, um, you know, we really truly are able to um, build uh, relationships with, you know, Lori's building relationships with the residents so that we're getting their feedback and we're getting information and they're taking pride in the facility. Um, we also feel like in regards to our personnel policies, which, you know, we go over and, and there's been a lot of, um, I don't know, uh, leeway with the policies and Lori has been really good and Mark's been really good about getting us back on track and treating everybody equally and then kind of moving forward. Um, also, um, you know, uh, Councilman Grabowski, it's appreciated that you come to all of our meetings uh, and provide input. And again, I want to also shout out to United Way. You know, they, they are such a great partner for us too, so. Oh. Well, it'll be two years in June when I got the commission appointment which um, I will say now is a wonderful position to be in. Two years ago, not so much. And I really appreciate Kyle Kotecki who covers our city council and everything because Mark saw my name on a city council report of being on the commission because I, I think all of you know I'm kind of public. And he tracked me down, came in and said, hey, I think I can help. And I'm like, oh, okay, come on, get on board. And ever since they brought their 30 years, Lori and Mark have brought their 30 years of experience to Manistee because Mark loves Manistee and our fishing port. And Lori has become a part-time resident and loves Manistee. And I will tell you, our residents now are happy. The family of our residents are happy, which is was my mission getting on it, um, was to make a better safer housing situation for our residents. They deserve it, we all deserve better housing. And we now have it, thanks to these two, their staff, and the diligence of the commission overseeing this, and the generosity of the community helping with certain things. So we do appreciate everyone's support. It's a positive thing. It's a good place to live now. So if you know anybody, there are a couple of vacancies. Thanks, everyone. Um, there's a lot of work still to do. I mean, it's, it, I mean, things are heading in the right direction, and I think that is recognized by everybody. Um, a couple things we just want to talk about 
Um, and I know I've talked to Bill about this, getting the Sixth Avenue on the capital improvement budget. Um, you know, and our goal is to help address critical needs in the community. I mean, I think the Housing Commission is designed and set up to be a housing provider. And we can grow, and there's lots of opportunities out there right now, uh, especially with some of you noticed some of the MISHTA news releases. Uh, and I would, and I said we'd get back to this, I would like, love to have a joint work session with the City Council. Just have the Housing Commission sit down and talk about some things that we think we can do um, and talk about the scattered sites and what your vision might be and what might the community like to see. So, that's, that's our presentation. Well, I just want to say thanks, Mark, because I have attended the meetings and it's really been a change since two years ago when I had to argue with certain people over there. And you guys have changed it all and made it great. So, and I have lunch with some of the residents over there and they're happier. So I appreciate your work. I just want to echo that. I've attended some of the meetings and there's just been a huge change from the community standpoint of sitting in at the meetings and how they're run. Um, I've heard from numerous citizens, um, you know, because sometimes a picture's worth more words than anything. They didn't even realize Century Terrace had that structure and landscape until all that stuff was dug out. So that's changed immensely. But I think the biggest thing that I've heard throughout the community and from residents is just, you know, your staff and really your board of commissioners has really given that population a voice. So thank you for that because they need that. So. Long overdue, mm -hmm. long overdue. And I love the resident-centered uh, focus. That's, that's huge. We want them to know that we care about them and you guys are providing that now. It feels so good, thank you. Yeah. I'm um, extremely impressed with what you guys have done in two years. You have an excellent housing commission board. Um, I'm sad that Jim Smith is no longer on the board, so hopefully you can find somebody that can replace him and a good fit for you guys, so. It's Thank a you. really good board. I mean, we have detailed, in-depth discussions on a lot of issues. You know, and our meetings, as Jim know, are probably an hour and a half to two hours every time. Where before they were 15 minutes at the most. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bill, when can we arrange a meeting to have a? Um, we can. Yeah, you know, work. I'll work with. I'll talk to Mark about. Yeah, you know, when they're ready to discuss um, the project. But, Introduction of the fiscal year 2023 budget. Administration has prepared the proposed 2024, 2020, geez, 2025 fiscal year budget. The finance director will give a brief introduction of the city manager's budget recommendations to city council and the community. The public hearing to review these budget recommendations and receive public input on them has been scheduled for Tuesday, April 16th, 2024. A study session has been scheduled for the budget discussion on Tuesday, April 9th. An optional study session can be scheduled if needed. I'll just provide a okay. brief uh, introduction. Um, so it's a collaborative process with our departments and uh, we do have a Sixth Avenue overlay proposed in this. So just throughout the year we get input and um, just we also ask council to provide their top three recommendations. Um, um, the ones that, that came out on top were public safety, police, fire, um, fire vehicles, streets, city services, and maintenance, and blight were the top items, and we look to address that in the budget, um, as well as some other issues. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ed to uh, provide an overview. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'm gonna run through the proposed budget. Um, as Bill said it's a collaborative process. It takes uh, a few months to pull everything together and have the internal meetings and, and get things all ship shape. But uh, I'll run through it here and kind of give you a high level overview. Um, but citywide budget highlights, that's all our funds. Uh, the budget's about 22.8 million, which is an increase of about 4.1% from last year. Um, you can see the two pie charts there just kind of show some of the areas, so the general fund is about eight million, um, and then you've got the sewer fund and the water fund um, next. Um, streets are about 2.7 million, and then everything else uh, lumped together is about 5.5 million. That includes the capital improvement fund, oil and gas fund, and things like that. Uh, the types of expense in the budget, uh, about 75% of that are operating expenses, 15% uh, of that's capital outlay, and about 10% is debt service. 
Um, a couple of really noteworthy things this year. Um, everybody knows the real estate market has been going through the roof. Uh, it was up quite a bit last year, and that trend has continued. The assessed value in the city increased by over $61 million, um, or about 19%. That's by far the biggest change we've had going all the way back to the days of Harbor Village. So that's a pretty tremendous uh, statistic there. Um, our taxable value increase was about $27.5 million, or about 11%. Um, however, a lot of that growth was in tax abated districts or tax capture districts. So there was growth in the BDA, there was growth in Joslin Cove, the Hampton Inn was fully on the tax roll, growth in the South Washington area. So um, a lot of that revenue doesn't necessarily flow right back to the city's coffers. The other thing is we had a pretty sizable Headley rollback this year. Um, we did not have one last year because of the very, very high inflation rate. Um, the inflation rate was very high this year as well but not enough to um, offset the uh, creation of a Headley rollback through the formula that the state prescribed. So because of that, we lose almost 2% of our operating millage. It goes from 17.2444 to 16.9581. And we'll talk more about the Headley rollback in a little bit. Um, the budget proposes about a 3.6% overall water and sewer rate increase, which is fairly consistent with the 3.5% we've been doing for the last uh, decade. Um, but we had to shift it around a little bit um, so we're proposing a 0% water increase and a 5% sewer rate increase. Uh, the blended average of those on a typical customer is how you come up with the 3.6%. Refuse increase is only 1.5% this year, which is about half of what it was last year. And the budget funds about $6 million in capital improvements. Um, in the budget, there's some issue pages towards the front. I'm going to run through each of those um, and kind of give you an overview of them. So, one of the issue pages has to do with employees, and this budget proposes three permanent part-time positions. The first one would be a code enforcement officer that would uh, report to the chief of police. That individual would be responsible for coordinating our code enforcement efforts, um, working side by side with the police officers, um, and be very critical in, in also enforcing blight. Um, that would free up the police department officers for um, other duties and activities that, that need attention. And it would also provide a focused person to, um, to really help continue to push the blight uh, elimination initiative forward. Uh, there's a part-time community development clerical assistant um, in the budget. And that really, um, after, you know, Teresa and Jerry have been here, they're seeing that there's some things that they, they really need a little more clerical assistance, um, even more than some of the other departments can provide. And that's really kind of going back to the historical staffing levels um, when we used to do the rental inspection in-house and had the community development department in-house. The scheduling, particularly of rental inspections, is very time consuming and it, it makes it difficult if the inspector has to do that type of work. So that position is um, included in the budget. And finally, we have a, a part-time facility assistant. Um, that was in the budget last year. Uh, it was taken out and then we replaced it with some money to do some contracting and that's been very successful this year. Um, our facility manager, Mark Hansen, has been able to get a lot of projects done because it's sometimes way more efficient to do construction when you have a helper. So this, uh, this proposed position would, would bring that person on board as a 20 hour a week employee and we would get, it would be at a lower wage than his contract rate and we'd get more hours out of them. Next item is the streetscape. As you know, the DDA has been working uh, very hard for, or for quite some time, probably going on two years now or, or more, to kind of pull together all the various pieces for the streetscape. And you know, they're getting much closer. Um, they've gotten their, their studies back and they've had all their public engagement meetings and now they've got to make the decisions on kind of what that looks like. But there's still a, a ways to go and there's a lot of decisions to be made. So some of the challenges, you know, you have to, they have to prioritize what they want to do in the project because they clearly can't afford everything. Um, what is the overall cost going to be? Um, how are we going to finance the project? And what funding is going to be there to support that financing? Uh, how is that project going to coordinate with um, the City River Street resurfacing, which will probably happen, and also infrastructure improvements? Uh, what's the coordination with the Riverwalk improvements going to look like? And what's the coordination with the Gateway project? So all those are pieces of the streetscape that need to kind of fit together. And then finally, what, what's the timeline going to look like? So that's going to be an area where we need to have more discussion, more work, but I think it'll start to uh, put itself together here over the next 12 months. Uh, another issue page is fire and EMS, and um, that issue page talks about three different areas. The first one talks about the ladder and pumper truck. We've had that in the budget for the last couple of years with kind of a sketched out plan. 
this puts a little bit more meat on that bone, um, but it requires council to kind of give staff direction to do that. So the idea is to, again, replace both the pumper truck and the ladder truck um, at a cost today between 2.5 and 2.8. That probably will continue to go up. And the, the idea for funding that is to put a ballot initiative in front of the voters in November of 2025 for a millage to support a bond. Um, that bond would probably serve us about $300,000 a year in debt service if that's the cost of the trucks and given some estimates about interest rates. Um, it'd be for a 10-year bond. And that would be approximately 1.35 mills. So the voters would have to approve that and that would be additional millage that would have to be levied. That's how the last aerial ladder was paid for and the city um, frankly can't afford to do it any other way. That, that needs to be how that is. But in conjunction with that, the budget talks about doing some, um, exploring some collaboration with the surrounding communities, particularly all around Manistee Lake. So Filer Township, Manistee Township, uh, Village of East Lake. And there is partial funding in the budget for a, a EMS service study. Um, it would require obviously buy-in with the surrounding communities and we would want some financial uh, participation hopefully with that. But that study would take a look at how EMS services are being provided in this area including um, you know, the, the ambulance service uh, as well as the, the fire departments and see if there's a better way that we can provide those services that provides a higher level of service. Um, you know, all these departments are having trouble staffing themselves. We have problems with um, our ambulance going out of the city. Uh, all these departments have duplicate equipment, and so there may be a better way to do that. So that's kind of what the budget is, is proposing. And then it also talks briefly about some fire station needs. You know, it's an old station. Obviously, we're trying to address the outside of it. The bids are out for that, but there's a whole lot more work that still needs to be done there. Um, and so we need to kind of look at that, but we do have some money in the budget to start doing a little bit of work on the interior um, and addressing some of those needs. So there's money in the budget for that as well. Next issue is the PFAS contamination at the old city landfill site. Um, obviously, uh, we've been working hard uh, and the consultant Fishback has been trying to uh, determine and finalize the extent of the contamination. And they've made really good progress on that. Um, There'll be a proposal coming forward to do a little bit more work to get that final level of uh, delineation that they're going to need before they start having conversations with EGLE. So you'll see something coming in a, in a future council meeting. Um, but I, the, from the work that they've done, um, it triggered required notices that would be sent to affected property owners. The uh, city manager had that in his last weekly update. Um, once that additional sampling has occurred and they've made all their uh, findings and kind of synthesized and then they'll do a report to send to EGLE, and then there'll be a conversation with the Eagle as to what the next steps are. So we've still got a little ways before we get there. Um, however, we do have additional money in the budget and the refuse fund budget to help do some of that work. There's a lot of unknowns with this, but um, it's trending in the right direction. So that's, that's good news. Uh, key issues, street funding. So the budget supports several projects. Um, for calendar year 24, which is how we look at the street improvement plan because it's over the summer months and it straddles our fiscal years. Um, there's $808,000 of investment out of the street funds or um, other city funds that aren't water and sewer. And there's about $2.2 million for total projects. So the total project includes water and sewer funds and also any grant funds that we might get. And there's two grant funded projects coming out. Um, this year we're doing something a little different and we're going to be funding some asphalt overlays for poor street segments. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second here. Um, one thing that we discussed when uh, Spicer and Jeff um, presented to council about a month ago, um, street funding, I, we just wanted to reiterate that, so this is also in the budget. But since we've been doing the PACER system and really managing these streets more scientifically and using Roadsoft and asset management, you know, 15 years basically of ever increasing investment because the state funding has gone up and we've put a lot more money into the roads, but if you look at that chart, it's not really moved the needle on the roads. I mean, we have not made much headway. Um, and we've really maximized what we can do with the current funding and current council priorities. So the only way we're gonna really make a dent in that is, is to get more revenue. And there's only a couple of ways to do that. One would be to do a Headley override. And I said earlier, I'd, I'd talk about that. So our, our charter allows the city council to levy 20 mills. And we've been had headly overrides since proposal a went in that have rolled that back to now we're below 17 mills what a lot of other 
entities do is they'll periodically, and you'll see it when they have elections, they go back to the voters and ask them to restore the millage because that millage has been rolled back and they restore and it rolls back and they restore it. Cities don't necessarily do that regularly like some of those other things do, but um, they probably should. And there are communities that will do what they call a Headley override. It's the same thing. You go to the voters and you ask them to restore some or all of that millage that's been rolled back. And that would allow um, those funds to then come into the general fund and be then reallocated to streets or other projects. So that's one option. Another option would be to do a voted millage that's in addition to what they're paying now and to fund a bond. That's the only way that we can do that. Um, in order to look at that, you'd have to clearly identify what street segments you wanted to do and estimate the cost and probably do it over a three-year period and then have a marketing campaign to kind of educate the public. So that's another way to raise more revenue. But as the Spicer chart on the bottom shows there, we've got way, 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 way more needs than we'll ever fund with the current revenue streams. So the bottom line is without more revenue, the street network isn't going to do much except stay flat, unfortunately. Okay, kind of moving on more to specific funds, um, general fund overview, uh, the budget's balanced at 8.09 million, first time it's ever crossed the 8 million mark. It funds all of the departmental needs, including operations, necessary repairs and maintenance and some capital outlay. As I mentioned, uh, proposes three additional part-time positions and that brings the total employment for the general fund up to 51, which is still below um, the peak numbers that we had, you know, maybe 20 years ago by, by, a, by a few. Um, general fund revenue, we had solid revenue growth this year of about 4.5%. Um, our tax base is growing, as I mentioned. Um, our state revenue sharing is growing. Um, however, it's growing because of the constitutionally protected sales tax revenue we get. The portion that the state legislature controls has been increased, but it's still almost $375,000 below what it was back 20 years ago. So if you had adjusted that even just for inflation, you can see there's probably $600,000 of revenue that we would normally be getting had they just kept the funding flat. But after the Great Recession in 2002 and then the 2008 recession, the legislature really balanced a lot of the state budget on the backs of local units by revenue sharing. So even though it is trending back up, a lot of that's because of the protected constitutional. It's not because of what the state is, is giving back to us. Um, you can see our revenue is about, tax revenue is about 52% of our overall general fund budget. Um, state revenue is about 19%. And then you have other smaller pieces of that. So almost two thirds is uh, state revenue and property taxes, which is it's held pretty steady over the years. It's gone down slightly. On the expense side, um, you can kind of see the breakdown here. Um, wages are about 46% of the budget uh, for the general fund and benefits about 23. So again, that's uh, almost 70% and that's pretty typical. I mean, we employ people to provide services and that's the biggest cost in the budget. Um, operating budgets um, are about 28% and then debt's about 3%. And then if you look at expenses by area, you can see police and DPW are, are about tied, um, about 1.6 million. Um, fire department's about 1.4 million. And then administrative is, you know, manager, finance, community development, clerk, those types of things, assessing, that's about 19%. Uh, just some highlights of the budget. Our budgets are pretty similar from year to year. We fund similar operations. We really haven't changed our service levels, but there are different needs that arise. So I try to highlight here what some of the changes kind of are from year to year besides just our normal inflationary costs. Uh, I mentioned the three part-time positions. Um, City Council previously approved an a increase in Council's compensation through the Compensation Commission, so that'll be kicking in starting January 1. Um, it has been well over a decade, right, Heather, since, that, 2009. since 2009, so it was kind of overdue. Um, there is $30,000 of seed money for uh, potential pickle, future pickleball courts in the general fund. There's also funding in the capital improvement fund, which we'll talk about. Um, the previously approved uh, software upgrade to BSNA Cloud will partially be paid for out of this budget. The budget funds the police bulletproof vests. Um, but they're also going to be asking for a revenue sharing grant. It's something that they have to do, so we have to build it into the budget, but hopefully we can get that grant funded. Um, in the fire department, um, under uh, Chief Herndon's leadership, there, he, he identified some areas that needed some improvements. So I mentioned the potential EMS study. Um, he's going to hire a consultant to help with some standard operating procedures that need to be updated, and also there are some interior improvements on the station that are being funded. 
Uh, in the DPW, we've increased their uh, rent payment to the motor pool significantly to help stabilize that. Um, as you recall, council allocated about $300,000 of fund balance to the motor pool, and that has almost all been eaten up by those huge price increases that we're seeing on equipment. So where we thought we had kind of stabilized it, it was starting to show red again. So we're trying to um, do everything we can to kind of stabilize that, but that's based on our balance budget. We're not asking for fund balance at this point. And then earlier this year, the, the Parks Lighthouse Keeper Association um, came and presented to you. So we do have some money in there for that. And also AAY requested a $3,000 increase in their appropriation. So those are kind of some of the big differences from the prior year budget. Moving on to water and sewer utilities, as I mentioned, the rate increase for water is proposed to be 0% and 5% for sewer, 3.6 combined. For our typical benchmark 6,000 gallon customer, um, which is higher than what our average customer actually uses, but we've always used that as a benchmark, it would be an increase of about $3.53 a month or about 42 a year. If you use less on that, your increase obviously would be less. Some key points on the water and sewer utilities. Um, we need to complete the uh, DWAM grant that we got, and they're working hard to get that done. Um, so that's, that's going to wrap up here probably sometime in the summer. Um, still dealing with uh, what Jeff McCoola terms aggressive mandates on lead service line identification and replacement. And uh, they keep changing that and kind of moving the bar, so we just have to keep tabs on that. Um, we are going to be re re uh, replacing water mains. Um, and because of some of the work that we're going to have to do, particularly in uh, combination with the US 31 project, that will require future bonding. And that was identified in the rate sufficiency analysis that we had done. So we're going to work backwards from when that needs to happen. But you'll see something coming forward at some point with the project list and the bonds for that and how that's all going to work. Um, James Riley is our new water lead man. Um, he took over from Bruce Banks. So um, that's been working out well. Uh, we have to, on the sewer side, the clean water recovery facility, um, the operation, we're still getting learning how to use that. And we still have to certify to the state that we can meet all those design parameters. And I know Sean and his crew are working hard on that. There's various capital projects, but on a much smaller scope on the sewer side than have been on the past. A lot of it is working on areas of the original plant that need to be upgraded now. So there's, there's always a lot going on at the wastewater plant. Uh, Bruce Banks is our new clean water recovery facility lead man. He used to be the water lead man. Um, he's working on getting his appropriate licensing, but he has to actually have time in working at a plant to be able to get that. And in the interim, Michigan Rural Water is providing our necessary license oversight. We contract with them for that. So that's working out well and saving quite a bit of money at this point. Uh, in the marina, obviously revenues are dependent on our weather and fishing prices. We had a really good year in 2020. Very, very good. Um, credit a lot of positive things that have happened down there. Um, you know, Katie does a great job running the marina, and uh, I think she's got her staff uh, really hopping, and, and the boaters recognize that. And we have a nice facility. So uh, this year, um, we've seen increased interest in seasonal slips already, so that's good. Um, the operational support, however, from the capital improvement fund is budgeted at 60,000. I think we're gonna be able to start to taper that off and then once the debt goes away in a few years, we should be able to pretty much eliminate that hopefully, assuming the operations can continue to increase. And as I mentioned, we have an experienced manager running the day-to-day -day operations, so that really helps. The boat launch, the rates are gonna remain at $50 annually and $10 daily. Um, it's pretty much self-sustaining. There just aren't a lot of costs. Um, we did pay off the the debt on the Arthur Street boat launch. So um, that is helping to actually accumulate some reserves in that fund to help do some future projects. Um, we have budgeted to replace the first street auto attendant this year. Um, however, it still works. Uh, has not had much downtime the last couple of years. So we need to find a machine that's actually gonna work well to replace it. There's clearly new technology out there, but um, we've got to find the right replacement. So that's on the, on the agenda to look at and see if, that, if we can find something that'll work. We're also accumulating reserves to potentially do improvements at Ninth Street at some point. Um, at some point, the large parking lot needs to be resurfaced and then um, potentially adding a kayak launch probably at Ninth Street. Okay, getting back to the streets, um, this kind of shows the condition of all streets. So we've got about you know 50% of our 
all streets, major local, are good or fair, and 50% are poor. And again, you can see the pacer line. It's gone up some, but it's been you know fairly flat, even with the millions and millions of dollars that we've invested. Um, this is in the budget. It's the five-year transportation, four-year transportation improvement plan, and you can see over that four years, it's split almost 50-50 between local and major streets. Keep in mind, the state gives 75% of the money that we get for streets to major streets because they expect you to take care of those major thoroughfares. We have, over the years, put an emphasis on local streets, and so that's reflected in the work here. And, and it, we are transferring money from major streets to local streets we're allowed to do, but just uh, as a note there. Uh, these are in the budget, but this is a map of the proposed street work. Um, one thing that's new this year, the two charts and the one in the middle and the one on the right. Um, we all recognize, and, and Sean Middleton and Jeff have talked about that, you know, on the, we don't have enough money to do all the streets. Asset management principles say you leave your poor streets poor, you're not going to get to them, you want to keep your good streets good. We reconstruct when we can with grants and matching them up with utility projects, but, you know, the reality is some of these poor streets really do need something. So. They're going to do a pilot project or proposed pilot project to do some overlay this year. This, and we kind of hit it hot and heavy. And I think we have about $120,000 of overlays that they've kind of prioritized here. So you can see the segments. And that's not a long-term fix, but it certainly will improve what's there and, and give, you know, add some extended life. Um, and if that works well, then, then, you know, then we can continue that. But that's one way to try to get to some of these poor street segments, even though it may not be the optimal way to do it, but at least we're trying to do something on that. In the refuse fund, I mentioned rates increased only one and a half percent. A tidy tote would go from 1750 to 1775 a month. Um, and we have to adjust those rates annually to offset our contracted rate increases um, from Republic Services, and as well as other cost increases. Mentioned the PFAS at the landfill. Um, there's also continued funding in the refuse budget for you know, upgraded trash receptacles, so they're trying to replace those as they go along. You can see in the chart on the right, uh, taxes only make up about 30% of that revenue and user fees are 64%. When I first started with the city, that was flipped 180 degrees. Uh, taxes made up two thirds roughly of the revenue. So there's been no desire on the councils I've worked with to raise that millage on the refuse, which we could do, um, but to put it on the user fees, and that's the path that has continued on. So that's why that chart looks the way it does now compared to how it would have been back in, you know, 2003, 4, 5, where it was much more on the taxes, but we've just kept that taxes flat. Capital Improvement Fund. Um, these charts kind of show the uh, breakdown of the spending in a couple different ways. So the chart on the left shows that we've got about $185,000 of existing debt that we're servicing. And then we've got $140,000 of what I'll call recurring expenses. And then in this year, 363 of new. And the chart on the right, which is also obviously in the document, shows that the, the spending is pretty evenly distributed across a bunch of different areas between equipment, parks, marina, streets, um, that sort of thing. The projects that are uh, contemplated in the budget are fewer than they've been in the years past, primarily because we need to supplement for the EDA Riverwalk grant. Um, when we went away from the previous engineer and, and, and the, of course, inflation. So we were using some of these funds to do that. Uh, but the other projects that are in there, um, you know, we've got existing uh, debt on the Ramsell HVAC, uh, marina debt support, um, capital improvement bond for streets and then uh, just a straight out appropriation for local streets of 80,000. So that's about 47%. And then kind of the new spending is um, some improvements to City Garage, which were originally budgeted in 23, but they haven't been able to get to them. Um, it's replacing the 50 year old bathrooms and the flooring in the City Garage, which is in pretty bad shape. Um, some surveillance camera upgrades um, that span fiscal years. Uh, Sands Park Tennis, there's some money in there depending on what the Sand Parks Control Board decides to do, which is unknown at this point, and it may be less than that. Um, one of our file servers is slated for replacement. There's $50,000 in here, again, to kind of set aside for potential future pickerball project, but those courts cost like $300,000, so kind of building up for a grant match or maybe partnering somehow. And then there's the $70,000 for the man-made late grant match, which um, we talked about. So. Uh, acquiring that last parcel. Motor pool, um, there's fewer 
fewer pieces of equipment being bought this year. That's a very deliberate effort from the department heads that have vehicles to try to keep those vehicles running just as long as they can, knowing that there's some financial limitations. So the first one would be another single axle plow truck. Again, we have 10 of those and they have a 15 year life. So you're replacing one every two years generally. Um, this one has been pushed three years past its expected life. So it's, it's time. And then an F-250 pickup, that was a 2003, same thing, it's been pushed at least two years past its normal use of life. Uh, there's a boom truck, which is, uh, you can kind of see in the upper right corner there, that's the truck that the guys use to trim trees and then they pull the chipper around. Um, and then one police cruiser um, is in there as well. So it's kind of a shorter list than what's been in the past. Oil and gas fund, um, just briefly, the, based on the spending rule, That'll spin off $433,000 to the capital improvement fund. That's the most it's ever been. So that fund is working exactly as it's designed. And the chart on the right just shows the oil and gas earnings um, going back to 96. You can see since 2008, when we first started investing that, um, like a pension fund, we've had much better returns, but we've also had more volatility, which again is totally expected. We've all, only really had one fairly negative year, but again, those are all pretty much unrealized gains and it, it rebounded. And um, this has been a great program for us to be able to preserve the purchasing power of that fund and continue to fund capital projects. Uh, Downtown Development Authority, their budget is in the city's budget. Um, it proposes spending about $215,000 of fund balance, including $240,000 for the, the community college plaza that um, they had agreed to. It does reduce the 70,000 maintenance agreement that they have with the city to 32.5, um, and then it increases facade grants because they got a state grant that they're passing through. You can see on the charts below that um, of the DDA tax revenue, the city provides about 62% of it, and all the other taxing jurisdictions are the other the other portion of that. Uh, finally, the this slide just kind of shows the path for the budget um, with our award-winning path down at the Riverwalk there. So. Uh, we are introduced the budget tonight. We've got a study session scheduled on the 9th. Um, the public hearing is at the regular meeting on the 16th and then a study session after that. And then if needed on the 23rd and or 30th, there could be optional study sessions. We haven't um, needed those the last few years, but they're there in case we do need them. And then the budget adoption is slated for the regular meeting on May 7th. So um, that's kind of just a budget introduction. Um, we weren't really prepared to answer many questions tonight. That'll happen at the study session on the 9th. But um, you know, if you do have other questions that come up, you can call the manager or myself directly if you want some stuff or need some clarification before that study session. So thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> citizens comment. This is an opportunity for citizens in attendance to comment on municipal services, activities, or areas of city involvement. Limited to five minutes. Letters submitted to council will not be publicly read. I don't know if I need to introduce myself or not, but I'm Jerry Johnson, owner of the Gold Silver Exchange, which is a temporary shutting down. As the comments started earlier tonight, uh, way off base far as I'm concerned, uh, I'm gonna, can I ask you a question? Maybe. It's just a comment section. Oh, right just now. comment. If you I have was just wondering when the DDA board was was uh, instituted. I don't. I don't. Okay. I've been here 13 years. Business operator 13 years. When I started here in 2012, early 2012, this this place was almost like a ghost town. You know, it, 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 it's all kinds of problems. We built, I, I, I spent my money, my hard earned money, helping this community. I still do today. I spend between five and $10,000 a year sponsoring stuff in this city, which is gonna be gone because I'm going to Parkdale. We just can't keep seeing the city do what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're losing business at 90 miles an hour, if y'all ain't noticing. I mean, I don't know what the DDA does or what they don't do anymore. I used to be very active in that. But the problem we had with DDA, we've had a, there must be seven or eight directors in 12 years. It's gotta be somewhere than that. We, my understanding, the DDA board director is gone again. He's retired, uh, resigned, gone. I don't know if we got another one. My point of this is this, 
you know, people are pointing fingers at everybody else. You know, we come, we come to these meetings, we have, we try to make sure we're saying the truth and nothing but the truth. When Mrs. Sadorsky makes comments that they're down my business, like she has, and Nikki, like she has, when you send pictures out like I'm holding my hand, from Lindsay Sordorsky to Chief Glass, she's in a parking zone violation. This is proof. I mean, this is not made up. You know, we're not making this up. We have got tickets that no violation has, has happened. Yeah, they got dismissed. Obviously, they got dismissed because you can't charge somebody a ticket when they didn't do nothing wrong. But the fact of the matter is, is they issued them. I mean, how much further this has got to go? I mean, you know what I'm saying? How much further do we got to go down this, this road track, this head-on collision, until, it, until it's too late? I love this little town. I am not from this city. I'm not even from this state. But I can tell you this much. I lost my wife two and a half years ago in this community, circling around me like there was no other. That is the only reason I stayed here with my business is because of that. We have losing that at 90 miles an hour. We've got business people coming in. I got over 400 signatures over the bird issue. We've, we've, y'all, we've been on national television if you don't even realize that. It's been crazy to see this going. Crazy. Won't we, won't we head back like we used to when, in 2012 when I came down here, when we were trying to get the vote theater off the ground and started with very good volunteers. None of the way in here that I know of sat on that board. That was a board that, that was endless about that, endless about raising money. I got $1,000 in it. I bought two chairs. So, you know, we, me and Nikki, as a business, we believe in putting our money back in our business. I funded the, the dance last year because the title sponsor pulled out. They came to my office within three days of the dance that said if we don't do it, or we asked this if we would do it, that they had to cancel it. That's $500. You know what I did? I wrote a $500 check to the lady. We had a beautiful dance down there. They had a great time. All of our youth, we ain't got much for our youth here in the first place. But it went off really, really well. You know, I'm not against the police department, neither is Nikki. It might seem that way sometimes, but we are for our police department. We, we, we sponsor them 100%. But, you know, we, you go ahead and go have... You know, you're going to have confusion sometimes. Sometimes it might be right, sometimes it might be wrong. I'm not going to say I'm perfect because I'm not. Sometimes I could be wrong, but I, I guarantee you this much. If you ever see me wrong, I will apologize. That's a fact. And I'm not going to say stuff like I was saying when people come up here before the meeting and, and start bashing somebody when they really don't know that person. You know, we, we did several things that happened in this city. When I moved my business from, four, from 309, 390 River Street to 431 River Street, we used sidewalk shock to have my people that didn't know where I moved to. Because, you know, sometimes the light is, the, the light, that, that intersection is a, if you did any kind of study, I did a study before I even put my business there in 2012. 85% of the traffic would turn left or right at that red light. 85%. There's not very many people who used to go through. Now there's a lot of people go through because that side is now we're getting that built up on the other side. So now they're coming through. But we're losing businesses on that side again. It's going down again. You know, we're, I'm, you know I'm not saying that we're perfect because we're not. But the, the name calling, you know, where Lindsay Sidorsky, you know. Mr. Johnson, this, your, your five minutes is up. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate your time, but yeah, I hope you, you understand where we're coming. Thank you. We will bring it evidence. We won't bring it talk out for you. It's unfortunate that Mr. Smith isn't here tonight, so I'll read this again next time. But three meetings ago, he told me I should be ashamed of myself. Giving that some thought and assuming that his way of thinking was the right way about shame, this is what I thought of. I should be ashamed that we donate $1,000 a year to Trooper Butterfield's scholarship and that I baked over 300 cookies for his funeral. I should be ashamed that I walk with Curtis every morning as he waits for me on the corner so that he can walk me into the shop where he has been making coffee for us for years. I should be ashamed of giving Kenny Coombs $2 a day for coffee at the outpost for over 10 years. I should be ashamed of cleaning houses for veterans during the week while I'm still working six days a week. 
I should be ashamed of making sure our customers are treated special for their birthdays by making them lasagna and their favorite dessert. I should be ashamed of having an annual Thanksgiving at our shop for the homeless, the veterans, and anyone alone where they can eat on glass plates with real napkins as we sit down all together and say a prayer as a family. I should be ashamed of my sister who for 10 years have hand knitted scarves and mittens for anyone in need. I should be ashamed of giving children treats and rocks and jewelry for free when they visit our shop. I should be ashamed for footing the bill for the armory dance because no other business stepped up. I should be ashamed for every holiday having a giving tree where children and adults can take any item they want wrapped pretty for $1 for a donation that 100% goes to Homeward Bound. I should be ashamed of having a customer appreciation day where we feed all of our customers and our surrounding businesses. I should be ashamed of helping out the needy at Christmas time when they actually get Christmas presents from a real Santa without our names attached. I should be ashamed of encouraging kids to draw pumpkins on the sidewalk for a Halloween treat. I should be ashamed of offering free hot chocolate to anyone in the winter who is cold on the street. I should be ashamed of keeping track of all the children we watch grow up and having them run into our shop every summer to get measured. I should be ashamed of being so close with our customers' children that we get invited to their graduations and to their weddings. I should be ashamed of shopping locally downtown every holiday where I buy gift certificates from D and Doe at the Spice Shop, Patty at Northern Spirits, buy books at the Happy Owl, buy $100 gift certificates at the Blue Ship, Bluefish, coffee certificates from Port City Brew for Curtis, Michelle and Becky Glicks for clothing items, Snyder's for shoes, Sarah and the Black, I'm sorry, Black Lotus for haircuts from Sandy and Trista Ann, and we send people to eat about eat at talk about it at River Street Station, coffee at the outpost, buy lots of books from Jim at the used bookstore, refining chairs from Kevin at Matthewson's, buying court tickets for the movies from Corey at the Vogue most Thursday nights, shirts from Vicky at our friends at the Bluefish, my nails done by Tina at Nash Nails 2000. I should be ashamed of helping Roger Gert stay in his home while people on this council were doing everything they could to get him out. I should be ashamed of saying good morning to everyone I pass by as I walk in the morning. I should be ashamed of helping out the needy by supplying free food for them when they are hungry. I should be ashamed of buying pies from the Glenwood. I should be ashamed of trading jewelry for bread and cookies with Loida at the bakery. I should be ashamed for buying little flags and passing them out to children at tight lines at the troops. I should be ashamed of taking care of the little birds so they don't get squished your by cars. I had this time, I know. Minutes no, up. it's not, I timed this. Is, so Trooper Smith, your with your way of up. thinking, your definition of my shame list can go on and your five minutes I is up. timed this personally five I times. Your five minutes is no, up. No, they weren't. Thank you. No, I know they weren't, I timed it. I'm not listening to this. Hi, I'm back. Um, I wanted to address the signs that are in the window at 431 River Street where the gold and silver shop is. Um, some of the signs that are in that window have been up since last summer. I'm sure you're all aware of them. Um, my name has been plastered all over them for months. Uh, for what reason? I have no clue. Um, I was told by my attorney to ignore them, so that's what I have did for months. However, the past couple months, they've gotten to be continually worse in content. Um, there was a, a chalkboard sign that read, if you are for the birds, flip one to Bill Gamble, Chief Glass, and Lindsay Swidorski. I have pictures of it on my phone if you want to see it. Um, most recently, there is a sign that says, if you are for the gold and silver shop, boycott TJ's pub, stop the bowling. Um, uh, somebody sent a picture to me of a chalkboard sign that is on city sidewalk that says, if you are for the birds and for, I don't know, sidewalk chalk, boycott TJ's pub. Um, over the past month, I have been on the phone with every city official I can think of, including the Historical Society, um, because according to the sign ordinance that I pulled from the city's website, any sign that is put in a window needs to be appropriate and appealing. I think we can all agree that none of the signs that are in those windows are appropriate or appealing. Also, they cannot be up for more than 60 consecutive days. Some of those signs have been up since July. 
I called the zoning administrator. She agreed that they are not appropriate, not appealing, and they violate the ordinance. She told me to call the police, that they, um, they handle ordinance violations. So I did. The police said, no, we don't handle ordinance violations. So I'm not sure who else to go to on this, um, but this is embarrassing, not only for me and my family and my staff. I have a, a server who works as a teacher in Bear Lake. She has parents calling her, asking her, what's going on with TJ's and the gold shop? My husband was in Ludington looking at work with city officials from Ludington looking at a job for the city of Ludington, and he's getting asked about it. That is embarrassing. My last name isn't associated just with TJ's. It's with Swidorsky Brothers Excavating, Swidorsky Trucking, three businesses who have been around for 40 plus years in this community. Um, and again, it's embarrassing for the downtown. Uh, I have talked to several people who don't even go to that side of River Street because they find the signs to be so intimidating. And I have talked to several merchants on that side who are sick of it also because people don't want to go down over there. So I'm, I'm asking if council can please come up with a solution to this to have these signs removed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Herberger. I'm a resident on the 400 block of Oak Street, and I would like to register my support for the city and what they've done about the, the thing with the bird feeder. I think it's ridiculous that it continues to go on. And um, I, you know, I've been in natural resources my entire adult life, and the things that are written and said about bird feeders on balance, uh, bird feeders are negative. They attract uh, nuisance birds. Uh, house sparrows are attracted to them. They are non-native invasive species. Um, they are, uh, attract other animals to them. Uh, you're putting up a bird feeder right next to a, a glass plate window. You're asking for injuries to birds there when you're, you're supposedly, you know, have it there to help the birds and birds don't need seed they can get by just fine without seed provided and then i would say that as a person i walk river street i'm proud to walk you know of our town i walk river street and uh, you know i got to pass that i don't want to give them the satisfaction of reading their their ridiculous signs but it is petty it's immature and it's insulting and it looks like trash. And I support that the signs, not only should the shot signs be taken down, but get rid of the bird feeders. They are a nuisance and they're unnecessary. And I fully support the city and all their efforts to get rid of them. And I don't know why the people who continue to flaunt the, the rules are so obstinate about this one issue. I have no problem with the store itself. Why is it so important to have bird feeders out front? I just don't understand it. They're unnecessary and they're an eyesore and then they make it worse with their signage. It is embarrassing and it's trashy looking. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. I think you all know why I'm coming up here. I didn't get to speak my mind last time I was at the meeting, so you're going to hear it tonight. This is ridiculous. My mother was also born and raised here, but has recently moved and has stated multiple times that if it wasn't for us close members, close family members that she still visits, she wouldn't come back to this town because of how ridiculous it has gotten. This is nothing more than a personal vendetta. They have been down on River Street for 12 years. Bird feeders down there for 10 years. It has only just now become an issue. You claim that there have been multiple complaints. It's one person. One person that has an issue with the bird feeder. I mentioned that if the bird feeders weren't there, you still have the birds. And you said, oh, it was a concern of other wildlife coming in. That is a lie. Because if other wildlife is going to come in, it could be the fish cleaning stations down there on River Street, the restaurants that have food outside, the waste bins from the restaurants that have food in them. That's going to bring in other wildlife. 
The city council members are nothing but bullies. Lindsay Swadulski is nothing but a bully. And you'll just make it up lies to cover your asses because you're abusing your power of position. Thank you. Anybody else? Hey, uh, well, I just want to address the issue of signage. Uh, I actually wrote an editorial on this issue called uh, Manistee's Gay Welcome Signs. So uh, I run a website called Manistee Speaks, and I've been trying over and over again to be allowed to put any size sign, even a little sign like this, in the yard of the senior center, which I'm not sure if it's funded by the taxpayers or not, I don't know what the story is. I'm told it's for the uh, Meals on Wheels of the senior citizens. That's where my taxes go. All right, whatever. But they won't let me put up a sign for Manistee Speaks, but they have this huge homosexual welcome sign that is put up, sponsored by MARGD, the Manistee Area Racial Justice and Diversity Initiative, which I'm 100% against. But they get to advertise with their URL right there on the Senior Center. And we have this downtown. A lot of shops also have those signs. And we're, I'm being told that if something's distasteful, someone finds it offensive, it should be taken down. I mean, I thought that was your right under the First Amendment. You could say what you want, have your own signage. You know, so the businesses have a right to put whatever they want in their windows. Now I'm hearing they don't. All right, well, if I find uh, these signs offensive, can I get them taken down? I don't know. Can I? Yes? No? Maybe? Maybe not, because uh, my personal feelings don't matter? I don't know. So some people's feelings matter more than others. I don't know what the thinking uh, I, I just heard was on that. Two people brought it up. Anyway, we got a First Amendment. We don't have a First Amendment. Someone let me know what is in current year. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Gamble. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so if council members uh, received the budget, if you could review them, uh, review the materials, if possible, send questions um, or concerns or comments to by Friday, close the business. We'll try to make it a very productive study session next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else over there? Oh. Mr. Pratt. Um, I just had a couple of things. Um, can we get an update, and maybe it would be a good time to get one, um, since it's kind of part of the budget, um, on blight and where that stands. I've received a lot of phone calls, so today I spent a large portion of my time driving around. Some of the houses are like repeat offenders. I went back through our notes. We've talked about them. There's a house on Maple Street that has three vehicles and a camper that are up on blocks boarded up windows, um, there is a house, well there's two properties located off of Washington and I noted the addresses so I can send them to you, but Washington and Jackson, like they have a commercial refrigerator unit and cars and scrap piles. Um, house on 4th Ave has had tarps on the roof for three years and scaffolding and there has been no work done at that house at all. Some of these are rentals. So I, I'm struggling a little bit. Like I get everybody has different obstacles. So if it's somebody that needs some help, I get the point of not wanting to issue them a fine and trying to give them that helping hand. But if it's a rental or it's been a property for three years, at some point, like the rubber has to hit the road, so to speak, with that. Because if I'm, my taxes are going up, but my property value is probably not going up to match it because somebody's going to look at that house next door and say, I don't want to take on that headache if I buy that property. So I feel like maybe we need to go back and look at what our blight policy is and what are we particularly doing about those rentals where people are getting income and those repeat offenders. We can provide um, an update on that. Okay. Um, as far as the DDA goes, I had received several emails about that um, with concerns about all these vacant buildings and I am downtown a lot, but I thought maybe I've missed something recently. There's not a lot of empty storefronts and there used to be, so I've attended most of the DDA meetings. Um, there's a lot of positive work. There's a lot of hard work that goes into that. Um, I commend the DDA board and the business owners because 
there used to be a lot of vacancies and now most everything is occupied. There's gonna be normal flow with businesses. So um, I just wanted to thank them for that. But I guess, can we as a council kind of get maybe what our next steps are? Because I've had a lot of people, some of these people are 30 year business owners that are reaching out about the ordinance change with the bird feeders. They're not happy. Um, I understand that. There's going to be two sides to every coin and decision we make, so to speak. But we made a decision. So I'm not understanding why it's been at a standstill or the public has seen that it's at a standstill because the phone calls and the comments, they're happening. And people are jumping to conclusions. And I'm not understanding, because I agree, there used to be sign ordinances. If you call and you get told the police have to handle that, but somebody else doesn't see that the police handle that. So I think there might be some confusion, but somehow I think we have to address this issue. It, it's gone on for a long period of time. So that's all. Mr. Krowski. Bill, who should they call if they can't call the police to handle this problem? So we, we had this, I had a discussion with the city attorney. Um, there are the historic district guidelines. They are guidelines. So we were having a discussion about enforcement, though, of, of those particular items. The, yeah, those are a little different than the sign ordinance in the zoning ordinance. <clears throat> the, the, the zoning ordinance has, has a sign section, which my recollection is it doesn't cover signs inside of windows. Uh, the historic district has guidelines. We're sort of looking into the enforcement of the historic district guidelines because they're generally used uh, for application purposes. So when you're setting up a business in the historic district, you'd say, well, here's the kind of sign I want and it would need to sort of meet those characteristics. But I think using that historic district guideline, which again is not a part of the zoning ordinance, using that um, as a basis for an infraction is something I'm currently looking into just to make sure that we'd have solid ground on that. I, so far, I'm not certain that we'd be able to treat that as an infraction, but, uh, but we may be able to. Because I'm sure Mr. Schwedorski would be interested in getting something done with this thing. Mm. I mean, I've taken pictures. I think everybody's taken pictures down there. Um, so it's got to be something done. Also, I see we're putting more money aside for pickleball. Um, I see that they want to take and uh, put graphs upon the old tennis courts when they tear them out. So the, I think the Sands Park Control Board, realizing that that area is now going to be an elementary school, there's a lot of teenage appropriate items there. Uh, maps under the control board has first um, priority on what goes in that area. So I think the future use is to be determined there. I know it. I think pickleball keeps coming up with that tennis court being there and maybe demolished, but I think MAPS is probably looking at what a future, a good future use would be there, considering that that's going to be an elementary school in the future. Well, I think I want to be in when they have their next meeting and I'm going to come up there. I think they need to get an earful. I think they're wasting time. That's ridiculous. Okay. It's fine. Yeah, um, there seems to be like a big hole at one of the um, ball fields by the beach there, and there's a plywood covering it. Things brought up that at first, yeah, first, yeah, and then they so we're we received a community foundation um, grant, and um, so that that area they were actually going to put in the awning um, kind of cover, and then when they dug down, there's actually electric there. So um, I'll have to make sure that they, they actually had to move the electric and then put the posts in for the for the canopy. So I'll take a look and see where that's at. I know that right. there's a kid that fell, and so we just got to be careful. A kid that. fell in? Yeah. Okay. Is there braces underneath there so that don't fall in, or what's underneath? There? I'll take a look. I think they put plywood down as a safety measure, but I'm, I have to make sure the work was done. But. Anything else? That's it. Yeah, I wanted to say a few things. Um, I look out here. And I see a lot of amazing people who have kept this city moving in such positive directions. I don't want to let some negativity bring us down. I don't want it to stop all these projects that we have going on. MDOT came up and told us about this 31, US 31 project. I thought, yes, great. Then we hear about what's going on with housing. Yes, great. And then we hear about you know the residents being part of the 
um, Century Terrace, great. We hear about all these different things we're doing in the budget. Everyone in this city is working so hard. And I just pray that we continue to keep the right momentum going and that we don't let negativity bring us down. Thank you all for being a part of the city. Motion to adjourn. Motion. <clears throat>